Check it out. It's the Laugh to Learn podcast. What is going on, everyone? Welcome to the Laugh to Learn podcast, your weekly source for a fun spin on all the news you need to know about. My name is Jacob Paveo, and as always, I come to you from the Great White North each and every Wednesday afternoon, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Fresh for you to download. You can listen to it all over the world, anytime you want, while you're driving home from work, at work, whenever you want listen to it. Uh, If you haven't done so already, you can follow me on social media and subscribe to the podcast. All of that information should be included in the description of this podcast. It is hot here uh, in central Ontario. It is really, really hot. Uh, The, this is crazy actually over, over the weekend, it was kind of cool. And then the pool uh, went up by, uh, four degrees celsius yesterday the our pool did so uh it's not a big pool it's like an above ground you know three and a half feet deep or whatever pool uh but it went from uh, 17 degrees celsius to uh to 21 sorry that was uh sunday and then yesterday uh it went from uh, like in the morning it was down at about 18 degrees and it went up to 24 uh, and it was like, I don't know, 31 or 32 degrees outside. So yesterday after work, uh, I went right into the pool because it was real nice. Um, probably going to do the same today because it's even hotter today. Uh, but uh, I hope wherever you are, the weather is nice and uh, things are good. And there's a lot that we can talk about this week. And, and I mean a lot. Uh, so on the Ukraine front, uh, and I mean that literally, the, the war front, there was uh, some big changes in territory between Ukraine and Russia. There's also a lot of word about Russia bringing in more reinforcements from their, their military and from their reserves and uh, conscripting more people to go and fight in Ukraine. Uh, which is causing a lot of controversy, um, as well. A bunch of world leaders, including Emmanuel Macron and uh, um, Boris Johnson, the leaders of France and uh, and the United Kingdom, uh, went to visit directly with uh, leadership in Ukraine with uh, uh, President Zelensky. And then, like, this was so weird. Ben Stiller went to visit with Zelensky. That was so random. I'm assuming if I really looked into it, there's maybe some sort of connection. Like, maybe Zelensky did the Ukrainian dubs of one of his films or something when Zelensky was still an actor. Or, I don't know, something weird. But either way, uh, Ben Stiller was in Kiev Um uh, as well over the last week. So a bunch of world leaders, an, a famous actor, all this weird stuff. Um, but then there's further fallout, which uh, we're going to talk about inflation here at home in the second half of this and really what it means for people. Because there have been a lot of questions uh, that have been sent to me uh, and asked privately about like what does it mean. So we're going to get into that. But uh, a lot of this is driven by the war in Ukraine. Not a, a lot, but some of it, I should say. And in particular, you know, we're feeling inflation here at home. But there are places that are suffering right now because Ukraine produced more wheat than any other country in the world, I believe. I think Canada was number two. It might be the other way around where Canada does more, but Ukraine does more to like Africa and and Asia anyways. Um, And so because basically they're not there, they are shipping some wheat still. Russia isn't... uh, destroying ships that are trying to leave they're probably just stealing the money to be honest with you but 
um, they are shipping out s- what what is able to be produced. But remember, a lot of farmland was just ran over with tanks and stuff, like a lot of it. Uh, and a lot of farmers had to leave, and there, so there's no one to farm the land, and obviously that means the wheat is not being uh, properly harvested and, and re- replanted and whatnot. So um, basically, there's a lot of especially North and Central African countries that rely on the Ukrainian wheat supply to the World Food Organization. I know this sounds like a crazy web, but it's real. So basically, the uh, the World Food Organization, I think it's called the World Food Organization, but you know exactly what I'm referring to, um, they rely on Ukrainian wheat to supply these African nations who basically it's all desert. They cannot grow their own food. So usually the World Food Organization uh, can uh, they can organize to have seeds sent to different countries so they can grow their own crops and teach them how to then you know, extract the seed from those crops and and replant indefinitely. And that's what a lot of places do. But uh, obviously desert locked nations that don't have fertile land and rain uh, or, you know, the money like Dubai to just make farms and, and, you know, change seawater into fresh water and plant things or whatever. Like if you don't have that kind of money, which most of these nations don't, you need to send food there constantly because they cannot supply their own food uh, in the quantities that are needed. And so now we're at a point where like the estimated number of starvation deaths for the next 12 months is climbing each and every month. Um, it, it's just such a crazy follow. But so yeah, there's so much we could be talking about, but I decided this week to focus on these two stories. So I already mentioned the second story we're going to cover today is all about inflation here at home in the West. Um, You know, here in Canada, we're seeing uh, the interest rates rise. Inflation is at a a decades long high, like a 40 year high, I think, for where uh, our inflation is at like 7.7 right now. And as I said, we'll get to that later. But I also wanted to talk about this story because I have talked about political correctness a lot and how I feel about it. (laughs) Obviously, I like to make jokes and joke around, and I don't care what a lot of people think about the jokes that I make. Um, And, you know, offending people, I think, is a privilege of living in the West, right? And I, I think the more you understand about the world, the more you want people to be able to offend each other at home, right? Because you look at a place like China and North Korea and Russia where you aren't allowed to talk about certain things without, like in North Korea's case and China, getting your head cut off or in Russia being sent to a work camp and or being shot out back by some guy who works for Vladimir Putin like there's all this crazy shit going on and then here at home people are upset about the just nonsense and just like oh my god you just need to open your eyes um but all this drama broke out at the Washington Post over the last week and a half or so uh and it all started around a female journalist whose name is Felicia Sonmez. Now, you might remember her. I didn't remember her at first until I saw this. I was like, oh yeah, I talked about that on the podcast. She is part of, or, or was part of a lawsuit where she claims the Wall Street Journal discriminated against her as a woman because she was essentially overlooked for a promotion so they promoted somebody else and not her and something whatever she's filing a discrimination suit that she lost so she was wrong about that uh she is going to be appealing that but just uh over the last week or two they threw out that discrimination lawsuit (laughs) it's just a joke that's where this is starting right so this is someone who works for a company still worked for that company while suing that company for discrimination so you hate your employer so much you are suing them for discrimination but you still work for them you know you couldn't go to work for any of the other 
newspapers or magazines that exist, you kept working for the Washington Post while suing them. It's just such a joke. So this all started with her um, because uh, earlier this month, she responded to one of her coworkers, whose name is Jose A. Del Real, uh, a reporter at the Post. Uh, this was on last Saturday, so I, I guess it would have been like June 10th or so. Um, she responded to one of his tweets saying this is terrible and unacceptable. And this is what the tweet was. So he retweeted someone who had tweeted a joke. And the joke was, every girl is bi. You just have to figure out if it's polar or sexual. (laughs) Okay? (laughs) A nonsense joke. I laughed. I actually laughed really hard when I saw what this was all about. Because that joke's actually one of the funnier ones, too, that I've seen these sort of nonsense arguments about. Um, But uh, she... Yeah, so she said that it was terrible and unacceptable. And then she went on to basically say that he needs to be fired and the Washington Post should be embarrassed and that she can't believe she works with these people. And it's important to note that these are journalists, right? So this is at one of the largest news organizations in the world. So this is kind of like a cashier at Walmart being upset, like in Wisconsin, being upset about something that happened at a Walmart in California and saying, like, calling themselves co-workers. You know what I mean? It's like she has never met this guy, never crossed paths with him, or very unlikely. Once a year, they probably have, like, a dinner around Christmas in New York City or Washington or wherever the hell they do it where everyone gets together, but they'll never really talk to each other. She has no idea who he is. They just write for the same billion-dollar news organization, or, well, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of a news organization, (laughs) okay? So all of this needs to be kept in mind. (laughs) So um, basically, uh, what ends up happening is... He starts tweeting back that, uh, quote, rallying the internet to attack me for a mistake that I made doesn't actually solve anything. We all mess up in one way or another. There's such a thing as challenging with compassion, end quote. So he came out and apologized and took the tweet down. Okay, I guess. Basically, like, I guess you guys don't like freedom of speech, so I'll take, I'll, I'll delete my retweet. He didn't even tweet it himself, right? It was a retweet. Um, And then she simply responded to his apology by saying calling out sexism isn't cruelty, but it's absolutely necessary. Um, And this is all on Twitter, remember. Um, And then over time, the Washington Post's uh, management basically tried to stop these arguments by releasing memos internally to employees that said, like, in the strongest of terms, all staffers are expected to follow these rules. And it specifically said, we do not tolerate colleagues. This is to every Washington Post employee. It said, we do not tolerate colleagues attacking... Co- this is so confusing, sorry. Quote, we do not tolerate colleagues attacking colleagues, either face-to-face or online. Respect for others is critical to any civil society, including our newsroom end quote but that did not put an end to it so uh a few hours later um basically she tweeted out a screenshot that she's blocked by this other journalist and i guess she's upset that he didn't unblock her and then you had a whole bunch of washington post journalists tweeting like please stop stop what you're doing uh like what what's going on and then she came out and said she tweeted, do you have any idea the torrent of abuse I'm facing right now? So sh- the one who started this, the chick that was mad that one of her coworkers tweeted a joke, the entire internet got mad at her f- because she said he should be fired. Like she literally called for him to lose his job and then the internet disagreed. And then she said she's being abused and started being the victim and whatnot. So her coworker was suspended for one month without pay. 
um, and then as time went on, though, she didn't stop. She literally didn't stop. She ended up saying that, like, the Washington Post is a great workplace for them being white men. Uh, she questioned the Washington Post in general, saying that they work for everyone else, but not for people like her. Like, she's a fucking rich, white, young woman in her... She looks like she's in her 20s. She's, like, basically my age, making more money than I do, bitching about... And I don't make not a lot of money. <laughs> bitching about her life. And I'm sitting here thinking, like, yo, what? Like, how unhappy can you... Do you have to be to get to this point and it's so sad because it's like you know that she's in a position as a journalist for the washington post at her age that you know students dream of like when you're in university or college or whatever for, in school for journalism or english whatever and your goal is to be a journalist she's there at the washington post and she's suing them and criticizing them and telling them this is a company for men and this place sucks. It's only great for men. And it's like all you had to do was shut your fucking mouth, collect your paycheck, and you, you have access to one of the largest audiences in the world. No one did anything to you. No one did anything to you. He didn't tweet at you. He had never met you before. It was just a guy on Twitter who gets paid by the same massive company which by the way is owned isn't it owned by jeff bezos or elon elon or bezos i think bezos owns the washington post one of them does i'm pretty sure it's bezos and it's just like one of the you know one of the preeminent billionaires in the world right now has you hired to write for his magazine like the richest man in the world is paying you to write for the washington post right now because they think you're that good and you're just going to bitch and complain about the job, the greatest job anyone in journalism could ask for? <laughs> like, what the fuck are you doing? You're a, like, this is the problem with this victimization society, I guess you could say. The, people, especially like I see this in people who are around my age and a little bit younger who just almost had everything too easy or something i don't know like i don't know what it is you know <laughs> but i i feel like if if you make it through and don't have enough challenges you have to create challenges for yourself right this chick is young and she is a a, a writer getting actual print space in the washington post and on the washington post website and that's not enough for her. She wants more. She wants that promotion. She wants, she, she it's almost like being um, self, it's just entitlement, really. And entitlement causes these type of issues. There were ultimately, the Washington Post fired her. So they threw away her lawsuit and fired her all within a few weeks. And now, who the hell is going to hire her? After all of this, you, she's unhireable. She went from, well, I'm assuming someone's going to hire her because there are probably people who support her. If I were her, I'd go make a Patreon right now. That's what I would recommend because I'm sure you have a whole bunch of crazy kids who can all afford $1 a month uh, off their parents' credit card to support you on Patreon. And But basically, like that's it. What are you going to do? You are not hireable. You're suing the companies you work for. for it's not like, you know, this isn't what workplace discrimination is that's not what it's about it's not like because i'm a woman they passed up on 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 this position or whatever the fuck her her case was about it's not it workplace discrimination is like you are actually negatively impacted by the opinion of due to a, a, a um uh, a, a characteristic you cannot change about yourself that your employer has about you that's just simply not the case, though. It's just not real. That, that, that doesn't exist. So it's this whole self-creating of a victimized environment. You're victimizing yourself in, in, a, in an environment where there is none to be had. You're working in journalism. It's like one of the most liberal places of employment there are. Could you imagine like, if she had to work in a factory somewhere? Oh, my God. 
God. HR would be like, shut the fuck up, woman. Like, it would be too much. The the HR reps would kill themselves. Like, you can't have this. <laughs> you can't have someone like this. I know in my company, they would just be closing their door when they see her coming. Because she would complain about everything. Right? She works in journalism, probably works from home, travels on their dime wherever she wants. It's never going to be enough. So, ultimately, uh, she was fired, as I said. And... It's just nice to see one of these people who, like I said, her coworker was suspended for one month without pay. And like, whatever, he agreed that he shouldn't have tweeted it. I think as a journalist, you should be able to tweet a joke because freedom of speech, I think, for the Washington Post should be an essential, uh, f- you know, an essential standard to uphold. But they obviously uh, think that that's not the case, so that's fine. Um, but... That being said, um, you know, it's just important to note that he accepted what he did. He apologized for what he did, and it wasn't enough for her. She kept going. And finally, one of these people suffered an actual punishment and was fired. And now we'll see if we ever hear her name again. Hopefully not. On to the last story of today, though, all about inflation. So, as noted at the top of the show, Canada's inflation rate hit 7.7%, the highest point since 1983. 1983, so that is a 39-year high. That's crazy. You probably already know this, but everything is more expensive right now, right? So, Gas prices today are 48% higher than they were one year ago here in Canada on average. Um, And this is the fastest rate that inflation has risen in 40 years as well. Um, uh, And in May, uh, it was the highest it ever went up in a one-month period. So Stats Canada reported Wednesday that an uptick in the price of gas was a major factor causing the overall rate to hit 7.7%. Gas prices rose by 12% in the month of May alone and are up by 48%. As I mentioned, food prices were also a major factor with grocery bills increasing to 9.7% in the last year. In the food category, the cost of edible fats and oils also went up 30 percent now it's this is kind of where ukraine gets tied in here because of course oil prices are going up because russia is not selling their oil to the west anymore and so places like canada and the u.s are trying to fill that gap and and supply more oil as well as saudi arabia to europe who were severely dependent on russia um you know here in canada it's funny because like we never bought any russian oil and we're still being hit by this because we're now selling our oil that we used to basically keep right we would kind of trade oil back and forth between the u.s maybe a little bit would go to europe but we basically kept most of our oil here uh in north america at least so it was cheaper Um, but that's not the case anymore um and now because wheat and sunflower seeds are not being grown oils which are derived from those products specifically sunflower oil is basically not available at all so it's causing other oil oils to be purchased in higher volumes um and obviously that's going to raise the price of everything um so uh This is a story from uh, CBC News, and it continues. Russia's invasion of Ukraine is a major factor in the uptick, as Ukraine is one of the world's leading suppliers of sunflower oil, and the war has caused shortages of the pantry staple, that being sunflower oil, as well as wheat-based products. Uh, The costs of home furnishings are also rising at a record clip. This is crazy. I have an anecdote for this in a second. With furniture prices increasing by 15.8% in the past year, mostly due to higher input and shipping costs, a major factor in that increase was the start of tariffs of up to 300% on some upholstered furniture from Vietnam and China starting last year. Uh, You may recall all of those trade war-like things going on between Canada and China last year. Now, um, after I bought the the house here, we bought, or I bought appliances for the living, or for the uh, living room, for the kitchen. 
And at the time, there was like, you know, they do those deals where it's like, put it on our credit card system or whatever, and you get 12 months interest free. Um, and honestly, I didn't spend that much money on it. I got a pretty good deal. And I didn't need a lot. I had already had most of the, uh, the appliances I had bought elsewhere. But I think it was the dishwasher and my stove or something like that. So we put that on this card, and it was whatever, 0% interest for the first 12 months. Well, I got a notice in the mail <laughs> that, uh, uh, so I got the stuff in like September or something like that, right? So I have no interest until September. And it said, any balance you have as of September, our fixed rates are going up. So the fixed rate, when I got the card, it's a one-year fixed rate with no interest, so it didn't matter. But it was a one-year fix at 30%. Starting <laughs> for me in September, when my one-year interest-free expires, it is going up to 54% annual interest. 54%. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> like, what the fuck? You would never pay that off. It, like, I mean, it's not, like I said, I think at this point, I only have, like, a few hundred dollars left. I think it's, like, I think it's, like, 300 bucks left. Um, cause I have it set to pay a hundred bucks a month now until it's over. But if you had money that's going to accrue interest on this, you will never pay that off. 50% annual interest. That's fucking crazy. That's nuts. That's like 0.3% interest per day. The CRA doesn't charge you that much when you're overdue on your corporate taxes. <laughs> like that's a crazy 50%. Holy shit. I couldn't believe it when I saw that. But it's all to do with this craziness. Like these companies are, they need to find ways to make more money. Uh, the story from CBC continues. Economists had been expecting the rate to increase from a 30-year high of 6.8% inflation in April. But the numbers for May blew past those projections. Prices increased by 1.4% in May alone. Seasonally adjusted, that makes 2022 the biggest one-month jump in inflation in 30 years. If you're not over 40, you have never lived through inflation like this, and unfortunately, we are not expecting much of a reprieve going forward, TD Bank economist Leslie Preston said. The inflation rate rose in every province from a lower of 7% in Saskatchewan to an enormous 11.1% in Prince Edward Island. Of course, one thing that a lot of people don't really think about are provinces that are more remote, like PEI, which is literally a small island, uh, you know, the Northern Territories as well. Um, it's already super expensive to get food to these places. So now, especially with the rising price of gas and energy, to transport product there, prices are going up and up and up and just continuing to climb. It's crazy. Um. And so, yeah, of course, we target a one to three point uh, one to three percent inflation rate uh, in my lifetime since 1994. Inflation has only gone above three percent four times. It did it in 2004, 2008, briefly in 2009. Uh and again in 2012. All of these were only for one month periods. However, uh, it has been above 3% consistently since the middle of last year. So that's really not good. Now to offset this, the one thing that governments can do is that the Bank of Canada is now more likely to increase lending rates, which are, uh, of course, the uh, the prime rate for things like loans and mortgages. The higher than expected inflation figure makes it all but certain that the Bank of Canada will raise its benchmark interest rate by three quarters of a percentage point at its next policy meeting in July in an attempt to rein in runaway price increases. The central bank slashed its lending rate to 0.25% in early 2020 to stimulate the economy through the pandemic, but in recent months, it has moved aggressively to hike rates. Another 75-point hike would bring the bank's key lending rate to 2.25%, the highest it's been since the 2008 financial crisis. While higher borrowing costs are likely to bring down inflation over time, the impact is unlikely to be swift. 
Um, interest rates began to increase in March, but monetary policy, of course, does not work overnight. Higher interest rates can't do much to solve some of the more critical causes of current inflation, such as supply chain problems and global conflict. So, what does that mean for you? Well, it means all of your credit rates are going up. Mortgages, credit cards, lines of credit, student loans, all of that is going up, and it's going up fast. So, my advice to people is to do what I'm doing, and it's to find ways to consolidate your debt right now. So, if you're in a position where you have... Uh, like assets that you can secure your debt against, I recommend doing that now and fix those rates. Consolidate your debt as best as you can because this is not going to stop. Um, I've seen one prediction that rates are going to go as high as 45 or 5%. Um, and at this point, that's totally believable because the, the problem is inflation right now is being driven by gas and food supply all of which are being completely fucked by Russia. So as long as the conflict not only continues, but the, you know, the different fallout from, from the conflict, such as farmers not working the land in Ukraine, the second most fertile place in the world for growing crops like sunflower and wheat, uh, and the different restrictions placed against Russian people's the Russian economy and Russian gas, as long as that continues, this is going to continue. So, honestly, I'm surprised <laughs> that we haven't become friends with Venezuela because with Saudi and Venezuelan gas, we could totally replace Russia. Uh, but, of course, uh, I don't know, man. You're picking one fucked up place over another. Like, fuck Russia, fuck Venezuela, like fuck Saudi Arabia, I don't know, like, it does, what does it matter, right? We have to do this stuff until we can get off gas in a more permanent way, but people don't want to build nuclear plants, so here we are, right? Nuclear power is like the one thing that the West can fully support itself on because Canada has all of the world's uranium, right? Like almost all of it. So Russia does have a lot too, but Canada has uh, the largest uranium mines in the world or the largest uranium uh, deposits in the world that we know of. So it's kind of like we could just build nuclear plants and never have to worry about this ever again, but... Here we are. So anyways, that's it for this week. Uh, I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed your hour. Well, it's only been uh, 33 minutes with me. Uh, and I hope to see you again sometime. If it was your first time here, thanks for checking it out. If you came back, thanks for coming back. And thanks for sticking with it to the end. As always, my name is Jacob Faveo, and I thank you oh, very much if you haven't done so already you can hit that subscribe button you can find all my information you can use the contact page over at www.laughtolearnpodcast.com as i was trying to say before i cut myself off you can find all the information to my social media links in the description for this episode which should be near that subscribe button which you should definitely hit and yeah until next time uh keep saving your money uh keep on staying warm in the nice summer unless you're in the southern hemisphere then it's your winter and i'm sorry but our winters are worse than yours unless you live in antarctica which if you do hit me up because i would like to know what that's like until next time friends keep on laughing and keep on learning hey.